Hello. Today, I'm going to talk to you about our work on the design of superconducting accelerators using temporal logic. As we know, the power consumption of supercomputers nowadays is at the megawatts level and keeps incrementing at a steady pace, while the performance development is lagging behind. Given that, if we want to achieve our future goals, we need to explore new devices and new architectures, both for existing and emerging applications. In this paper, we focus on superconducting technology as an alternative to CMOS, and we propose a new computational temporal logic that can unlock its true potential. In contrast to semiconductors, superconductors have almost no resistance in the stationary case of non-changing currents and voltages. This characteristic brings the promise of orders of magnitude improvement, both in terms of speed and energy efficiency, even when the high cost of cooling is included given that superconducting devices now require cryogenic temperatures to operate. Besides its advantages though, superconducting is still considered a highly complex solution. Are the challenges in adopting this technology inherent to the nature of the exotic materials and environment though? Or are they an outcome of the mismatch between the existing computational abstractions and what superconducting devices actually provide? To better understand the situation, Let's start by taking a quick look at the way superconducting gates work. One of the most popular types of superconducting technology today is rapid single flex quantum logic, or shortly RSFQ. In RSFQ, information is stored in the form of magnetic flux quanta and is transferred in the form of picosecond duration millivolt amplitude pulses. For example, here we can see the case of an XOR gate the arrival of an input pulse within a time window as that defined by two successive clock pulses has the meaning of the binary value 1, while the absence of the pulse during this period is understood as the binary value 0. Obviously, the notion of a clock period is critical for this concept, but it also creates a number of significant implications, as now every gate is sequential rather than combinational, which is what we know in the CMOS world. In practice, that means that a clock signal has now to be routed to every single gate of the design, while advanced path balancing techniques are also necessary for the synchronization of timing along the various paths with that level of precision. Is that though our best option when it comes to computing with superconductors or we can do any better? We claim that the switch from the well-known Boolean logic to a computational and temporal one can alleviate many of the existing concerns and provide interesting new opportunities. To introduce our idea and support our claims, in the rest of the talk we are going to go through the following steps. Initially, we're going to review the basics of race logic, which is going to serve as the base for a computing paradigm. Then, we're going to propose an extension to existing temporal logics commonly used by the verification community and formalize the basic operators of race logic. After that, we're going to show their implementation in RSFQ and present a data-driven self-clocking scheme that eliminates the need for clock trees. Finally, for the evaluation, we're going to present the design of three temporal superconducting accelerators. In race logic, information is encoded in delay rather than in binary format. For example, let's assume that we have two variables, x and y. For the representation of their values, only a single wire per variable is going to be required. When x equals 2 in a synchronous system, then a positive edge is going to be observed on that wire after two clock cycles, while for y equal to 3, an edge is going to appear after three clock cycles. Now, if the signals get routed to an OR gate, we know that the OR gate is going to fire when the first high input arrives. Thus, an OR gate realizes the mean function under this representation. Similarly, for the implementation of the max function, an end gate can be used. As we know, an end gate will fire only when all its inputs are high. Given that a flip-flop can delay a state transition in the wire by one clock cycle, a shift register now is going to realize a constant addition. Finally, for the realization of the slightly more complicated inhibit operator, an SR last can be used. In the case of uh, inhibit operator, we have two signals racing against each other. If the data signal arrives before the inhibiting one, then it will go through the gate without any problem. However, in the case where 
the inhibit signal arrives first or at the same time as the data signal, then it's going to block the latter's way and no state transition is going to be observed on the output. Now, one basic assumption here is that each event is represented by positive edge. What happens though if pulses rather than edges are used? Judging by the given example, such a change is going to cause a number of problems. For instance, the OR gate now is going to fire two output pulses, which violates one of the basic race logic constraints for at most one event per wire, while the end gate is not going to fire any pulse at all. In the case of inhibit, we're going to have edges rather than pulses, which violates our assumption about the pulse-based system, while all these events suffer from wrong time too. So obviously, if we would like to port this idea from an edge-based system to a pulse-based one, we have to rethink about the implementation of all these operators. To close, the semantic gap between the existing descriptions of the basic race logic functions which are over the set of natural numbers and the pulse-based way that hardware works, we proceed with the formalization of our primitives. For this formalization, we'll use the existing propositional temporal logics commonly used by the verification community as a starting point, and then we will augment them in a way that will allow us to express the desired computation. Among this family of logics, linear temporal logic, or shortly LTL, is the most well-known one. In LTL, its moment in time has a well-defined successor moment. The basic operators of LTL are eventually, always, next time, and since. The eventually property holds for a system S at times at t if and only if there is any point in the future where formula phi gets satisfied. Property always holds at times at t if and only if phi is satisfied now and forever into the future. In a similar way, the functionality of the remaining operators or any other function built out of them can be easily described. Pass LTL is a derivative of LTL. Pass LTL augments LTL by providing past operators such as the sometime in the past, always in the past, previous time and since. In other words, while the scope of traditional LTL is from time t to infinity, past LTL's operators refer to the past states of an execution trace relative to this reference point. For example, the property sometime in the past holds for formula phi at time t if and only if there is any point in the past or present where formula phi gets satisfied. For the formalization of the race logic primitives that follows, we primarily rely on the sometime in the past operator. Now, let's revisit race logic primitives. As we already discussed under this representation, mean function is equivalent to first arrival. The first arrival property holds for formulas phi and psi at times at t in a system S if and only if either phi or psi hold at times at t or prior. Last arrival, which corresponds to the max function, holds at times at t if and only if both phi and psi hold independently within the given scope. And similarly, we can proceed with a specification of the functionality of the remaining operators. What is really important to highlight here is the fact that all these definitions are based on a propositional temporal logic, and what is going to be returned is just the predicate. The notion of when, which is so critical for our computing model, is missing though. To address this issue, we introduced the earliest occurrence function. The proposed function is paired with the existential primitives of the classical temporal logic and extends the notions of sometime in the past and sometime in the future with the notion of when an event occurred. For instance, when the earliest occurrence function is applied to the first arrival formula for the inputs of the given example, the outcome will be 1. For the last arrival formula, it will be 3, and so on, so forth. Now, that we have specified the functionality of our primitives over temporal events and decoupled them from any underlying assumptions, let's see what our implementation in a recipe queue will look like. In the beginning of the talk, we briefly discussed how a superconducting gate works. However, we did not say much about its implementation. In superconducting, the basic switching device 
is not the transistor, but rather the Josephson junction, or shortly, the JJ. The Josephson junction is made by sandwiching a thin layer of insulator between two layers of superconducting material. The junction is characterized by a critical current that depends on its construction and the operating environment. If a current that goes through the junction exceeds this threshold, then the junction will transition from its superconducting state to a normal one. Its resistance will increase and thus a voltage across the junction will appear. Now, let's assume that we have a superconducting loop in which, as we know, flux is quantized. The addition of two Josephson junctions in the loop allows switching and gives us one of the most fundamental RSFQ circuits commonly known as the superconducting quantum interference device, or shortly SQUID. In the absence of any external magnetic field, the input current I splits into the two branches of SQUID equally. When an external magnetic field is applied to the superconducting loop though, a screen current IS begins circulating in the loop. The induced current is in the same direction as I in one of the branches of the loop, while it is in the opposite direction to I in the other branch. As soon as the current in either branch exceeds the critical current of the corresponding Josephson junction, a voltage will appear. The squid generally has multiple applications, but in the case of computing, it is frequently thought as a basic memory cell and is heavily used for the construction of stateful gates. Now, we use Josephson junctions and squids for the construction of our race logic operators in a RSFQ. We will not go through the details of all these analog implementations here, but rather we will focus on a higher level of abstraction that will still give us a good idea about their realization in superconducting. In the case of mean, a merge component and a flip flop are used. In the case of max, a C element is used. The C element consists of two squids and is not going to fire until pulses have arrived to both of its input ports. For the implementation of inhibit, a synchronous inverter is used, but now the clock signal has been repurposed. For the constant addition, we have a series of Josephson transmission lines. A Josephson transmission line is used for interconnection in superconducting, but also introduces a constant delay. Finally, for the realization of coincidence, which is supposed to fire only when two pulses arrive at the same time, a synchronous end gate is used. To evaluate the functionality of our designs, we perform simulations at the SPICE level and check their results against our specifications. Now, what's important to remember here is that the two main challenges in the construction of Boolean logic-based RSFQ circuits are clocking and synchronization. We already saw that in our temporal logic, computation happens based on temporal relationships rather than perfect alignments, which relaxes significantly synchronization requirements. What happens with clocking though? Interestingly, the implementation of max and add constant operators are by nature asynchronous. Well, besides the fact that synchronous components are used for the realization of mean and inhibit, these components are also synchronous as their clock signals have been repurposed. These four operators form a functionally complete set. However, in some cases, such as coincidence, the use of a clock component may make sense for further efficiency. Does that mean though that clock trees are still required as in the case of Boolean logic? Or we can avoid them and do any better? To address this issue, we propose a data-driven self-clocking scheme. Now, let's assume that we have any synchronous logic block that gets input data from other either synchronous or asynchronous blocks. We claim that the input data pulses can also serve as a desired clock signal. To route these pulses to our block's clock port, a couple splitters and a merger must be used. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a waveform showing the timing relationship between the data pulses and the generated clock pulses. The propagation delays of the splitter and the merger are the ones that are going to define the input window for this component. If we want to make this window larger, a number of JTLs can be used after the merge element 
in order to introduce some further delay. What is important to understand here is that such a solution is not easily feasible in the Boolean case. In our computing paradigm, a temporal gate can be safely considered idle when no input pulses arrive. However, this is not the case in Boolean. For example, in the case of a NOT operator, an output pulse has to be generated when no input pulse arrives within a defined window. Now that we have understood what race logic is and how it works, we have formalized its primitive operators, have seen their implementation in RSFQ, and have discussed the main idea behind our data-driven self-clocking scheme that allows us to stitch such gates together without the need of clock trees, let's proceed to the evaluation part where we'll go through the design of three temporal accelerators in RSFQ. The first design relates to Needleman's and Wundt's sequencing algorithm. The goal here is to find the similarity score between two arbitrary strings P and Q. Initially, a two-degree grid is constructed then we decide about how to score its individual pair of letters. And finally, we move through the cells row by row, calculating the score for each cell. A temporal accelerator for this algorithm was presented in the original race logic paper back at ISCA 2014. The main idea is that we will have a systolic array where each of its cells will look like the one shown at the bottom left corner of the slide. At time step zero, an input signal will be sent to the top left cell of the grid. And the time it will take for that signal to arrive at the bottom right corner of the grid is what is going to define the similarity score between our strings. If the signal propagates diagonally, we have a match. If it propagates vertically, we have a deletion. And if it propagates horizontally, we have an insertion. Next to the CMOS implementation of the cell, you can see its realization in RSFQ. Details about its main differences from its CMOS counterpart can be found in the paper. Now, if the strings of interest are ACT and GAT, for example, the input signal will go through five cells before it reaches the grid's output. Our spice level simulation results verify the functional correctness of our RSFQ design for this case. The propagation delay of each RSFQ cell is approximately 38 picoseconds, and the fact that the pulse's travel time is 192 picoseconds denotes exactly 5 hops. Now, if we're adventurous we're, and we are willing to relax some of the race logic constraints, achieving some further efficiency may be possible. For example, if just the merger is used to implement the first arrival operator, we'll have significant gains, both in terms of speed and area. However, such a change is not always safe. To guarantee that a relaxation will not cause any malfunction, what we have to do is to use our formalism to verify formally that the resulting design actually meets our specs. Besides the string sequencing accelerator, we have also developed our SFQ accelerators for the race trees architecture presented at last year's ASPLOS and the feedforward temporal network realizing arbitrary function tables as described by Jim Smith in his ISCA 2018 paper. For more insights about our implementations, detailed simulation results, and performance comparisons against CMOS, please read our paper. Also, if you're interested, you can go to our GitHub account and download all our designs and simulation files. Please do not hesitate to contact us for any questions. Take care and stay healthy.